Boker Tov, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the Aliyah today. I was trying to find a comment made on the channel uh, yesterday because I wanted to, to use it um, as a... Uh... Oh, here it is. Yes. Praise God. I'm sitting, I'm sitting here looking for this comment. I want to use it as an illustration for our com conversation today. A discussion about God's treasure because um, a lot of times comments that come into the channel end up providing a great springboard to discuss things and illustrate mindsets and uh, help us to kind of unravel those mindsets, uh, at the very least explain how people think and why a lot of times what they're thinking is, of course, not biblical, uh, and also give us an opportunity to not make those same mistakes, not just with the theology, but with all, also with this the, the overall attitude, which I intend to uh, address some of that uh, today as well. So good morning. Glad you're here. Hope you're doing well and being blessed and being full of uh, favor and so forth. I, I uploaded another podcast last night. I tend to do podcast typically in the evening, although it's not limited to that. Uh, my my goal on the podcast side of things is to try to do at least one. I'm really trying to would rather do two uh, podcasts uh, a week. And uh, these podcasts, I, I, I've i decided I'd, I'd like to focus on the nuggets in the Midrash Rabbah, which of which there are many, um, that don't they don't I don't get to talk about them very much usually they they get left on the proverbial table because we just have so many insights and a lot of times uh, the topic whether it's the drosh or the yaliyah may not you know it may be off the topic of whatever it is we're talking about but they're still amazing so I have done uh, a few lately uh, blood from the rock the blood of the Torah and last night uh God I, there was a it was a dual title because I couldn't make up my mind what <laughs> what exactly to call it but but basically God is a priest and Hashem say himself saves and so I'd encourage you to do that I put the link to that podcast in the description of this video uh so that you can take advantage of those so just another element uh of um you know a way to connect with Lapid. you know uh people who don't care for us very much, um, who don't exactly maybe care for me personally for whatever reason, who, who knows? And frankly, who cares? Um, you know, <laughs> one of the things that they say, <clears throat> is they want me to stop talking. They like very much for me to, to just close up shop. That is the common theme, uh, from people who are, um, you know, not exactly thrilled, uh, that we exist. And there's lots of psychological reasons for that which I know, um, and I won't, I won't, uh, waste time getting into cause it, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, but what's funny is that, uh, to me anyway, cause this is just how I think, um, you know, whenever you tell me to stop doing something, I typically just do it more. And so that's exactly what we've been doing. So since they told me to, you know, be quiet, go, go to a corner and please stop talking. I've actually produced, um, a lot more videos and so, and it's kind of inspired me actually to do well more talking, and so, it's as a result, as a result, uh, now we're doing uh, video shorts, um, one a day, maybe, maybe, eventually, maybe more than that. I don't know, at least one a day. So, and, and I've, and by the way, I find the shorts uh, a new, fun, exciting, and thrilling medium. Uh, to use now. And it's just, it's, I really started enjoying uh, putting those together and putting them out there. And of course, you know, that just, it, it reaches a whole, not necessarily a whole different audience, but it's a different way to reach a broad audience. And uh, those shorts uh, are designed um, by YouTube. Uh, really to direct people back to the full video and so on. It's just, it's just a great thing. It's just a great thing. And so shorts, um, podcasts, working on some more uh, blogging, that's, that's a little bit more time consuming, but working on that, uh, more Facebook posts, more Instagram posts. It's just, <laughs> we just stop talking. And now, now the B-52, uh, you know, B-17 flying fortresses are overhead. Yeah. 
uh, we, we were throwing grenades. Now we're launching uh, mortars and, uh, you know, super fortresses. Uh, but anyway, it's just funny. I find it funny. Okay, so good morning. Glad you're here. Welcome, everybody. Um, good morning, Chris and Crystal. Good morning, uh, Christopher. Who else do we have? Peaches, good morning, formerly from Georgia. Good morning, Marciella. Good to see you this morning. Ariella, hope you're doing great. Marita, yes. Good morning, Lepidnik, she says. Good morning, Marita, from sunny and beautiful Las Cruces, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, by the way, my Revisane and I, a long time, uh, back in 2000, mm, doesn't matter. When was that? What, 2015 or something? Like that. Anyway, we went to uh, Tombstone. I know it's not in New Mexico, it's in Arizona, but interesting place. I mean, that's about as, that's, that's about as far south as you can go. Very interesting. Anyways, it was nice. Brenda, good to see you. Uh, Roy, good to see you as well. Who else do we have here? Sergio, good morning. Good to see you. Leia, hope you and Shmuel are doing good and all the, the girls. Uh, Brooke, Milka, good to see you this morning. Hope you're doing well. Levi, there you are. Welcome, sir. Uh, who else do we have here? Have I, Sherry, good morning. Shoshana Keith, good morning. Uh, who else do we have? Grace. Welcome, Grace from England. And Isaac, good morning to you, sir. Carol, good morning, ma'am. Keturah, welcome. Ahava, good to see you. Uh, Amy, good morning. Hope you're doing well. <clears throat> Marlee Stevens from South Africa. By the way, one of the best, in my opinion, this is just this is an opinion, but it, one of the best kosher wines comes out of South Africa. And Gianna uh, Warden introduced me to it. And uh, I thank her very much for that. Um, who else do we have? Matthew, good morning. Good morning, good morning. And Eliezer, Eliezer, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, Eliezer's job takes him all over Florida, I think, right, Eliezer? You, you travel a lot. Seems like you do. And so as a result, he does like a, uh, you know, goes all these kosher restaurants that are and, and stores around around the state. You know, Eliezer, you ought to do like a kosher restaurant slash kosher market uh, traveling video, uh, kind of like you did yesterday for me privately, and send that to me, and uh, I'll 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 put I'll put those on the channel. Um, I will I will work the magic and do that. Haniel, good morning. Hope you're doing well. So listen, we have a great group today. Wonderful people. Awesome people. Hey, let me share. The, cause, okay, so the Aliyah today is about um, the giving of the Torah. Exodus chapter 19. Very, very, very good uh, insights today. The giving of the Torah. So let me um, let me start out, I think, with this comment on the channel. Maybe that's the best place to start because it's interesting. On the drosh, uh, I, I just talked about the lie of Romans um, chapter five and verse 20, where Paul um, says something that is absolutely false. Uh, but, but even more than being false, it is an, a, it's, it's absolutely um, heretical. And that was that the Torah, the purpose of the giving of the law of Moses, the Torah was so that sin could increase. Now, other people translate that or interpret that to mean that <clears throat> um, uh, that the reason the law was given is so that we could know just how terrible we are um, and that we would therefore be all the more motivated to... Um, you know, give our life to Christ so that we could have, you know, we could be saved by grace, right? So as opposed to trying to be saved by the law. In other words, trying to live by God's law is 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 only going to show us just how pathetic we are and how just uh, terrible we are. And, um, you know, and, and so we'll just basically crumble into God's arms. You know, there's lots of... Uh, flaws with that, not the least of which is that the Bible says the exact opposite. God says the exact opposite. When he talks about the law, as we're going to see here today, and the reason that it was given, um, and then we look at the patterns and so on and so forth, uh, 
you know, the, the big buzz kill for Paul in Romans 5.20 is that the scripture says the exact opposite. And that's a real challenge for Paul. And I, I, I appreciate his frustration on that. Um, because it's never, you know, whenever you're putting something together theologically and the Bible says the exact opposite, that's always, that's always just a, a, a just a big Debbie Downer. Um, and I empathize, but that's the fact. And so the other problem with it is, is just common sense. How many of you, um, how many of you know people that are secular people out there? They're not religious in any way. Anybody? Great. How many of you have noticed something peculiar about said people? And that is that none of them are trying to get saved by following the laws of Moses. Anybody notice that? Anybody? Anybody notice that when you're out in the world and people are that, that people are not s s curled up in a fetal position in a corner wringing their hands because they are been trying their whole life to follow the laws of Moses in order to be saved and, and have only hit a brick wall and now don't know what to do. Anybody? Yeah, I don't, I don't either. You know, um, I, so I find it peculiar, the church's message that they're out there telling people, you don't have to follow the law to be saved. You can believe you can have the grace of God. And my first question is who's trying to do that? I've never met anybody who was secular who was trying to eat kosher, as an example, in order to get into heaven. I've never met anybody who was secular who was trying to eat kosher. <laughs> I mean, you, you know what I mean? So basically, and so this is the problem with straw man arguments that, that ha do not exist and never have existed, is that you can't find anybody who's following it or trying to do it because it doesn't exist. You say, well... I created this straw man argument that people are trying to work for their salvation. I can't find anybody who's trying to work for their salvation. Yes, genius, because you created that false argument. Nobody's trying to do that. Not even the Jews. So that's problem number one. But listen to what this person says. And, and this, this comment came in uh, because this person just loves Paul to pieces. Uh, which isn't uncommon. And that, that's the context of this um, person's comment who, who doesn't appreciate my stance on Paul. Okay. It says, to understand, she, and this person writes, to understand what Paul taught is to understand the power of God's grace, which is mightier than the law. When I read this, I want you to know I want to break out in a Pentecostal singing. But I'm going to refrain. <laughs> The person goes on to say the law was for the knowledge the law was for the knowledge of sin so that the world might become guilty all caps before God and get on our knees and plead for mercy on our souls there is no time to get on our knees if we are too busy doing all caps the law for righteousness it's beautiful if you let yourself see it, that's the comment. And the reason I want to share you that comment with you is because that is a very common thought. And it is absolutely one, it, one kabillion percent biblically false in every way. And yet people believe it. This person is saying the reason that the law was given us so that we would know what sin is so that we could become guilty before God, so that we would bend our knee and plead for mercy of our souls. And if we're too busy doing the law, which is a waste of time, even though God told us to do it, and he sent 50 prophets to tell us that, then we're just wasting our time. We need to stop obeying him so that we can obey him. It's utter foolishness. It's complete idiocy. Pardon me for using that word. Um, and it's completely unbiblical. It's frustrating to read that. Now, the same person, this is now this is my next life lesson for you, Lapidniks. And you, this I'm preaching to the proverbial to the Levitical choir here, so I get it. But I went on to try to explain to this person that their opinion about Paul is just frank, frankly, um, not it's not scholarly. And I shared with them 
some scholarly scholarly resources, not my resources. These are scholars who study his writings, who have, you know, legitimate doctorate degrees, not ones that you get online. Um, and they've been studying this for 30 and 40 years. And they, they, they actually, they actually read Greek, like ancient Greek, you know, coin, coin, the, the ancient Greek tongue. And they, they all know because Paul said it, that he made up his own gospel. Paul actually, see, Paul actually literally said that. Okay. But anyway, I digress. And so I shared this with this person and this person did what a lot of Christians do. They completely rejected it and said, I don't need no stinking scholars because I've read it for myself. That's literally what they said. Completely rejecting any type of subjective, um, or excuse me, objective, pardon me, uh, rejecting any type of objective scholarly input. And then, of course, they went on to say my favorite thing, which was that they don't need the scholars. They don't need the sources. They don't need the resources because you, you, you just, you're, you're reading my mind. I can tell right now. I can see the Jedi skills are working. You've, you've, all of you have turned on your lightsabers. You know, right now what I'm about to say, don't you? They don't need the scholars. They don't need the sources because they've been, wait for it, led by the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, yes. My favorite, extremely dangerous people. Please don't do that. Please do not do that. Um, very, very, very foolish. Uh, yeah. So let's look at what God actually has to say, shall we? <sighs> Interesting, isn't it? Um, where shall we begin? Let's begin by reading the text. It's, it's This is probably one of my most favorite po portions of Scripture. It's Exodus chapter 19. Beginning in verse one, Let me move this over here. I got to create a little room for myself. I got so many books. So it says here in chapter 19 and verse one. Okay. Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if we said that about, so probably the most important thing in your entire life is, is theology, right? Spirituality. And yet, we're just going to just leave it up to our own personal interpretation. Whatever the King Jimmy says to us, that's that's what we believe it. It says, and whatever a scholar says who studied the original language, what is they? What do they know? Please, hashtag whatever. But we don't do that with anything else, do we? So, I mean, do, people study diet plans. They study uh, all kind health issues. They study science. They study all, and and they we pay attention what. What people have to say. It's so foolish. The Satan, by the way, is so crafty. And by the way, that is arrogance. And it's the sin of Adam showing itself. Why? Because if you get to interpret it for yourself, then you're God. Congratulations. So it says here in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, In the third month from the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt on this day, they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They journeyed from Rephidim and arrived at the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. And Israel encamped there opposite the mountain. <clears throat> so it goes on to say in verse 3. Um, hold on. Excuse me one second. Pardon me one second. There we go. Um, Moses ascended to God and Hashem called to him from the mountain saying, Show, so shall you say to the house of Jacob and relate to the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to Egypt and that I have borne you on the wings of eagles and brought you to me. And now if you hearken well to me and observe my covenant, you shall be to me the most beloved treasure of all people. Hence our title today. I want to focus in on this concept here because he says, uh, and now in verse five, and now if, very important word, uh, if, you hearken well to me and observe my covenant. You shall be to me the most beloved 
of, tre of the treasured possession, okay? And now, if you hearken well to me and observe my covenant, you shall be to me the most beloved treasure of all peoples, for mine is the entire world. So basically what we're seeing here, okay, is that God is telling us that if we follow, if we hearken and observe the covenant, which is the laws of Moses, then we will be the treasured possession of God. So this right here, th this one thing that I've read, looking at it from, the, from this angle, we see if that, that it completely destroys Paul's argument. Because his argument is, if we follow the covenant, then the, the purpose of following the covenant, li living by the law of Moses, is only so that we can become big sinners and learn what sin is and all this other kind of nonsense. But, but that's not what God said. God said, if you actually hearken to, to this covenant and follow my commands, then you will be for me a treasured possession. So how can we become the treasured possession of a shim? And the answer is by following the commands of God, the following the laws of Moses. You sh and he goes on to say, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests or ministers and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. So, again, does anything I just read to you from the mouth of God, does anything sound even remotely like it would support anything that Paul says about the, the reason for the giving of the Torah? And the answer, clearly, if you're rational, the answer, of course, is no. In fact, to the contrary, now, I want you to think about this. If Paul is right, then if we try to follow the laws of, of God, then all we're going to do is heap up sins upon ourselves. And we're supposed to, at that point, I guess, like this, this person said, guilty, all caps, realize how guilty, all caps, we are. So we'll get on our knees. And yet, God is saying, actually, no, if you follow my covenant, you will be my treasured pe people. And in fact... By following my covenant, you will become a kingdom of ministers and a holy nation. But wait a minute. Those two things can't be true. Because either God, has shalom, is lying to us and setting us up for failure in the most sadistic way. Or Paul is, is tell, not telling the truth. But it can't be both. This is why... This the same person, by the way, in this conversation, and, and I'm just using this conversation as an example to as an illustration of, of, of many conversations. But this person exhibited, in my opinion, cognitive dissonance in suggesting this person actually suggested in this same conversation. I want you to see the I want you to see the the, the irrational disconnection that this person suggested that Paul upheld the, the laws of Moses, upheld the Torah. Well, well, you just got through telling me that Paul taught that the Torah only brought guilt upon us and was only its only purpose were, was for us to, to lead us to grace. So, so how could he simultaneously uphold the Torah? You, you see what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? Like, that doesn't even make sense. But that's what happens with cognitive, cognitive dissonance, that something doesn't make sense. And so you have to reinterpret it. And it just becomes a big mess. It becomes a big mess in your mind and in your heart. Because it's you can't make sense of, the, of that which is nonsensical. You end up just being incoherent. So the fact of the matter is, is that he's he's going to make as a kingdom of priests. Rabbi Monk writes about this. This. Uh, this phrase, a kingdom of priests, Ma Melechet, Kohanim. The lofty title does not confer any privileges or special advantages upon the Jewish people. Rather, it requires them to fulfill a very specific function. So, in other words, 
you're going to be my kingdom of priests because you're following the law. And that's because you're doing something related to the law. Okay. Which is, by the way, ministering to the world. So it goes on to say, the minister or Cohen is described by the prophet Malachi as one who, by word and example, spreads God's knowledge and faith. He appears as an angel of God. This is Israel's destiny among the nations. Israel is God's permanent messenger of truth and morality. <clears throat> In other words, so now we're seeing something here uh, again. Whereas Paul taught us that, or tried to teach us anyway, that the, the purpose of the law was only so that our transgressions could increase and we could realize how terrible we are. That's what he said. But God said that the reason I'm giving you the law is because I want you to be my ministers on the earth to spread knowledge of me. In other words, the way in which we spread knowledge of God is precisely through the law of Moses. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if we understand this, now this is God, okay? If we understand what Hashem said, it is directly opposed to what we read in, in Romans. It's the exact opposite, okay? So, another interesting aspect of this, by the way, uh, the sages bring down a couple of interesting in insights. It says here, um, you know what? Let me let me read this from about the, the kingdom of priests. Let me read this from Rabbeinu Bakya. <clears throat> Rabbeinu Bakya quote, uh, commenting on the phrase, and you shall, and you are to me, uh, to be for me rather, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It says the plain meaning of these words is that you will be my share. God calls the Jewish people kings, priests, and a holy nation at the, at the time they receive the Torah in order to make clear that he who wears the Keter Torah, the crown of Torah, also has attained the stature of the two other crowns, priesthood and ro royalty. Now, I can tell you, there's a lot of people out there, <clears throat> believers, uh, supposedly, who really want to be kings and priests, right? Do, do you agree with me? They want to be kings and priests. They believe themselves to be kings and priests. And and, and quite frankly, to be to be fair, most of the people who want that want it for the right reasons. But here's what they don't know. You cannot be a king and a priest if you have rejected the laws of Moses. Why? Because in our passage we're reading today, God has directly connected them. I'm giving you the law of Moses in order that you will be for me a kingdom of priests. You cannot be a king and a priest. Well, you know, so people say, well, I'm a, we're kings and priests in, in JC. Do you accept the laws of Moses as valid and authoritative in your life? No, I don't. Then you're not a king and priest. And JC is not the Messiah. If he if he teaches you to do something other than the laws of Moses. By, by biblical, Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13 nullifies the Messiahship of any would-be Messiah that leads you away from the laws of Moses. Deuteronomy 13. It's crystal clear. It's, it's, it's black and white. It's absolute, period, right? So any Messiah who says, you no longer have to eat kosher, you no longer have to keep the Sabbath, or you, you, you know, whatever, we, th he makes it optional for you. He makes it obsolete for you. However you want to, whatever word salad you want to use, any Messiah who nullifies the law in any way abrogates it, makes it obsolete, makes it optional, is by biblical definition a false messiah, period. There's no way around that, okay? But going back to this concept, if you deny the Torah, you if you deny the crown of Torah, you necessarily deny the crown of priesthood and the crown of royalty. And why are they called crowns, by the way? It's because there are three pieces of furniture in the holy place and the holy of the holies. Actually, there's four, which would be the, include the lampstand, but the three that I'm going to focus on are the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and the golden altar. 
And each of those three pieces have crowns upon them, okay? And uh, each of those three pieces represent Torah. The, the ark represents Torah, the golden altar, priesthood, and the, and the table of showbread, kingship. And that, each of those have, li they literally have a crown around the edges. And that's why this crown, that's where this crown comes from, right? So it says, this is the meaning of the statement by the sages in Horiot 13, that the meaning of Proverbs 3.15, she, wisdom, that is Torah, is more precious than rubies, seeing that the crown of Torah includes the other two crowns is more precious than rubies. Although the high priest, the crown of priesthood, may enter the Holy of Holies, a great distinction, the crown of Torah is superior even to that distinction. Why? Why is the crown of Torah even greater than the crown of the high priest, even since the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. And that, the reason for that is because the crown of Torah is upon the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant is always in the Holy of Holies. You see? That's, the, <clears throat> that's why. Now, with respect to where the Torah was given, there's some interesting insights here. The Gudna Kumash says, it is highly significant that the Torah was given in the desert, the, the desert of Sinai. This emphasizes, as our sages point out, that the Torah is not conditioned upon any particular place or time or any normal set of living conditions. This is a very important point because a lot of people believe that the Torah came at a certain point in time and therefore um, it, could, it could not exist at a certain point of, point of time. But of course, that is... Um, uh, that is not at, at all, um, you know, legitimate. Something else, uh, there's another insight about the Torah being given in the desert. And, and basically it says that the Torah is given in the wilderness so that it can be accessible uh, to all people. And that's an important insight as well, that the Torah is accessible to all people. Now, you cannot, that, that does not mean, by the way, that if you're not Jewish, you can just come appropriate the Torah for yourself and reinterpret it for yourself and do it for yourself without any type of, of, of connection to Judaism or Jews. Remember that the Torah was given to Israel and Israel is its guardian. Israel is its, um, you know, holder. So the Torah is accessible to all men, but you have to come and, 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 and you have to come to it like the Jewish people came to it. Do you understand what I mean? So another interesting insight here, this comes from the Legends of the Jews, uh, volume one, page 595. Um, it says, it's talking about Mount Sinai. It's very, very interesting. It says, and, and we'll, we'll just kind of conclude with this uh, insight today. It says, Mount Sinai was given the preference not for its humility alone, okay, because, you know, Mount Sinai is not the greatest of all the mountains. And so it, there's an insight here that talks about the reason it's given on Mount Sinai is to is, is so that one could be humble in soul and spirit. So it says Mount Sinai was given the preference not for its humility alone, but also because upon it there had been no worshiping of idols, whereas the other mountains, owning to their height, had been employed as sanctuaries by the idolaters. Mount Sinai has a further significance to, listen, listen to this, this is so interesting. Mount Sinai had it has a further significance too, for it had originally been part of Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, on which Isaac was to have been sacrificed. But Sinai separated itself from it and came to the desert. Then God said, because their father Isaac lay upon this mountain bound as a sacrifice, it is fitting that upon it the children would receive the Torah. Hence, God now chose this mountain for a brief stay during the revelation, for after the Torah had been bestowed, he withdrew again to heaven. In the future world, Sinai will return to its original place, Mount Moriah, when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. That's a remarkable insight because it teaches us 
that the Torah was given upon Mount Sinai, which had originally been part of Mount Moriah, specifically because of the sacrifice of the only begotten son, who is the image of his father, laid upon the altar for the sin, forgiveness of the sins of Israel. End of our Aliyah today. Now we know that God gave us a Torah, not so that we could be big sinners or recognize that we're sinners, but rather so that we could be a kingdom of priests to spread his message to the world. Thank you so much for being here. Please be sure and like this video and share it with all of your friends. And listen, if, you've enjoy, if you're enjoying these programs, if you're a part of the P Judaism, I want to encourage you to continue to be financially faithful to this ministry and, and give to this ministry. We need your financial support. I'm asking you to be faithful in that and help us to continue doing what we do each and every day. God bless you. God love you. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, have an amazing and wonderful day.